This is everything that we in the feminist movement are working against. Um, and, you know, and they, you know, pointed out quietly uh, that, you know, my living was being made and a very good living uh, based on my not bringing up issues like this. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to announce that we have on our show today a Warren Farrell coming to speak to us about his book, The Boy Crisis. So um, just to give you a little bit of introduction, uh, Warren has done so many things that it was a challenge to actually produce an accurate summary of what he is and who he is, so to speak. So uh, Warren has been an expert in witness in child custody cases. He has written eight books about uh, issues to do with uh, men and boys, and particularly his most recent book in 2018, The Boy Crisis, which we'll be getting into today. I've recently read it. It's a hell of a read. But without any more of my waffle, let's introduce him. Hello, Warren. Well, that's the best introduction I've had. A hell of a read. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to start this quickly by asking what motivated you to write this book? Um, as, as you know, I was um, on the board of directors of the National Organization for Women in New York City, and I was speaking all around the world on women's issues and the importance of secure men being aligned with and connected to um, in a positive way with women's issues. And um, I remember being in Japan and a teacher, a Japanese teacher came up to me and she said, you know, uh, Dr. Farrell, in my class, um, boys are having more problems than girls. I heard the same in the UK. I heard the same in Australia, I heard the same in Canada, mm -hmm. and then was beginning to hear the same in the United States. And so I started, my radar started to sort of um, get tuned into the possibility that, you know, that while I was making a great living, uh, speaking on all the damage that was being done to girls and women, mm -hmm. maybe there was something right in front of me that because I was, you know, bribed by uh, my um, fame um, supporting women, that maybe there was problems with boys and men. Mm -hmm. Well, at the same time, I was forming uh, men's uh, consciousness raising groups and I would always give them lectures halfway through about, you know, what they were missing about feminism that they should absorb. Mm. And one day I decided to do this thing called listening. And instead of, <laughs> instead of me, you know, spouting all the things that had made me um, famous, mm -hmm. I started to listen and I heard um, boys, um, ha young men having problems, They're the ones that were older in the group, we had men in the 70s, mm -hmm. um, and they were having problems, um, uh, and the, I'm sorry, their sons were having problems, and I began to just, uh, I, I saw how many men who wanted to be musicians, artists, writers, they had given up their dream mm -hmm. so that they make more money to support their family. Mm -hmm. And the feminists were accusing them of, you know, making more money and therefore having more power and therefore more privilege. And they were saying this thing about making more money, the more money you make, the more you have to give up of yourself. Um, mm -hmm. That you that fulfilling jobs pay very little because there's lots of uh, demand for them and little supply. Um, but the uh, but but jobs that um, are like in technology or engineering or um, finance uh, those aren't and uh, uh, those aren't so much fun to do. But they help support a family a lot better. So I I, I was I had a, one man in one of my groups who was a, a wonderful, caring heartfelt man. He was probably the best elementary school teacher you could possibly imagine. Mm -hmm. But when mm -hmm. he had children, he had to give up teaching elementary school to go into become a principal or a superintendent of schools, ultimately a superintendent of schools. And, you know, he would have been a, a, a feminist example of, oh, he, you know, uh, men, there are less at men and fewer men in education, but they still dominate the education field. Mm -hmm. Well, he had no interest in dominating. He hated administration. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and his heart was broken that he could no longer teach, but he couldn't afford to mm. teach. But then there's uh, the additional injustice there of them using his decision, which he was forced into, to to get promoted as proof that men are um, inherently dominating. Yes, and exactly. Goodness they're, me. And that, and that they're you know that that we're the perpetrators, and that women, and that we've women back. Um, but in fact, uh, and, and then I started, you know, I did a research for a book called uh, Why Men Earn More, um, uh, the truth behind the pay gap and what women can do about it. I looked at 25 things that men and women do mm -hmm. uh, in, in the workplace and found that every single one of those 25 were things that men do, do that lead them to earning more money. But all of those things are things that women do 
that lead them to earning less money, but having a more balanced life and a more fulfilling life. Mm. And so when I looked at the word power, I realized that power is not about feeling obligated to earn money that someone else spends while you die sooner. Yeah. That power is about being fulfilled and having the and having the social approval to be fulfilled. And when men in each generation, each generation, as we ha- we know, had its war, mm-hmm. and in almost every war, um, you know, pe- people in the UK and the United States and Russia um, sacrificed hundreds of thousands of men uh, to be able to prevent Hitler from taking over. Um, and so we were willing to die so women would live. Um, and that's not male privilege. Uh, that's male disposability. Mm-hmm. And so um, I, be- I began, as I began to sort of understand and hear these things in real life terms, um, I had one man come up to me and say, you know, you're, you know, you're, um, you're, you're forming your men's group saved my, you know, just um, really turned my life around. Um, it, it led me to having um, uh, to to giving up my um, career for five years and being able to focus on my son, and it was the best you know five years of my life. Um, I, I actually, at that time, it was only two years. His son was only two years old, and we're talking for an hour. And um, and I you know, I finally find out when somebody comes up to ask what I thought was me for an autograph that in fact they were asking him for an autograph, and it was John Lennon. <laughs> <laughs> It's quite the story that is. So I'm yeah. now officially two degrees of separation from John Lennon because of yeah, this that's interview. Fair. Oh, that's yeah. fabulous. <laughs> that's a story for the day. But no, that's it's incredible because John Lennon, of course, is a man at the top of the hierarchy. Could you be a more successful musician than John Lennon? And yet, mm-hmm. these social problems that you describe are felt even there. Yes, exactly. I mean, he said that. Uh, you know, some people say to me, "Well, you know, John Lennon had all the money; he could quit." That's not the way he saw it. He saw the fact that he had, um, he, he we, in the men's group, um, we asked, I have men's groups ask the question, what's the biggest hole in your heart? And when it came to him, he said, the biggest hole in my heart is having not paid attention when my first son was born and ending up getting a divorce, not really getting to know my first son. And he said, now, and without telling me that what his wife's name was, mm. uh, he said, now um, my wife, uh, I, I got married again. My wife is pregnant. We found just found out that it's going to be a son. I'm afraid I'm going to do with my next son the same thing as I did with my last son. And uh, and the, the men in the men's group said, well, have you talked to your wife about maybe taking some time off uh, to spend with your son? And he said, no, no, I haven't. That would be sort of, I don't really think I should do that. And the men pressured me into doing that. And so I did it. And the woman who was my wife, he never said Yoko Ono, uh, was, um, you know, she said, go for it. Yeah, John, you've earned it. Mm. And and the group said, great, you're going to go for it. He said, no, no way. I've, I have dozens of contracts, legal contracts. I can't, I can't get out of them. I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm in a prison. Mm. And Many people don't realize that people who are wealthy are oftentimes tied into their, their, you know, they, they feel that their business owns them. They don't own their business. And so the group confronted him on that. And he backed, he said, I backed off and said, well, maybe I should do that. Now he said, I've been, I was sued a lot and there was a lot of legal problems, but I did free myself to be able to raise, uh, to, to be able to raise uh, Sean. And um, he said that I, and I asked him this, uh, that Sean was only two years old at the time. And I said, well, was this a good decision? And he said, no, it was the best decision I have ever made. Mm-hmm. Um, he said, I, you know, I used to write about love, talk about love, but when you, um, you know, when, when you're, you're looking at every smile, every frown, um, every move that, uh, that someone makes, and you're not thinking of yourself and your next song, your next writing, your next ego um, boost, um, but you're thinking totally about somebody else, that's love, Warren. And I said, yeah, I really agree. But it does seem there that, and one thing I've noticed through several of the stories that you mentioned in your book is that oftentimes it seems men need that group. They need to outsource that uh, that perspective of looking at themselves and asking, what do I want? What would be good for my happiness? And so on. Have you found that yourself? Absolutely. And there's there's an enormous amount, you know, what what we what I as a feminist did not understand was, you know, I, I saw like feminists did 
um, we, have, we have to remember the, the background here. Uh, feminism arose, you know, after the civil rights movement arose, and um, and the civil rights movement had a legitimate oppressor oppressed, um, and then Marxism um, was a, a pre- oppressor oppressed dichotomy. Uh, the, the early feminists that I worked with, like Betty Friedan and uh, Gloria Steinem and p- people like that, they were they were very much more oriented toward um, people who have more money are the oppressors. People who have less money are the oppressed. And men, as a rule, made more money than women did. That didn't mean that they had more money, but they made more money that oftentimes the family spent and had. Um, and you know, in those days, it was almost always the intact family. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and these were the men that felt the pressure. So I bought into that hierarchical um, um, buy-in of oppressor oppressed, mm-hmm. and I and I never saw it. From my uh, from the male point of view, uh, and but then when I look back on it, I saw it from my dad's point of view. Um, he had been in um, Holland running a company, and my mother felt like she wanted to move back to the United States. She was depressed in Holland, too much rain, um, and the, um, and so my father, you know, ended up giving up his job, um, and he was in his late fifties. And those years, in your late fifties, you were considered over the hill. Uh, nobody wanted to invest in you and pay the so, you know social you know all the the pensions and stuff like that. So he was walking the streets selling floor brushes after he had been the manager of an international company, and um, and I never admired him more than that. But I saw his heart break that he you know that that he had um, uh, that that he had worked so hard to be able to earn the money that the family mm-hmm. spent. And now, even though he gave up his job because he wanted to be with my mom and come back to the United States to be with her, mm-hmm. he nevertheless was out on the street selling floor brushes um, from door to door. And, and so, for, uh, and this was his sacrifice, but he never talked to me about this being his sacrifice so until- what was it? Sorry to interrupt you, but- what was it that, because most people who were feminists in the 1970s are still 1970s feminists today, more or less. So I really want to ask you, what was it that made you even think of considering your father's situation in the same universe as the problems of men and women in society? It was the forming of the men's groups. It was people like you know John telling me their stories, but I was hearing the story from every single man and amazingly, even at the beginning of forming the men's groups, I couldn't listen. I had my ideology dictating. My ideology was I put forward, you know, I, I was just waiting for the opportunity to explain to them why they were the powerful people that were the oppressors. And I was making a good living doing that. Wow. <laughs> I had to, you know, and when I started bringing up these issues, um, you know, the beginning of my insights to the boy crisis, particularly about the the, the challenges that um, boys and girls have, but mostly boys when they're without fathers. And I started bringing up my first insights to that on the, to the board of directors of the National Organization for Women in New York City that I was part of at that time. And, um, and I saw that I wasn't able to be heard, uh, that, you know, the, that the feminists were saying, no, uh, our feminist members, they want um, they want women who are divorced to have the choice uh, that they are the ones that know the most about the children uh, and they should be able to decide whether the children um, should stay with their father or they can get a, a new life with a new man and move the, the children away from where the biological father is. And I said, this is like saying that, you know, that, um, that women, uh, men are doctors and lawyers and engineers, and we know the most about that. We should have the choice to be the doctors, lawyers, and engineers, and we should develop the terms of which, uh, and we should decide whether or not you're eligible to be doctors, lawyers, and engineers. This is everything that we in the feminist movement are working against. Um, and, you know, and they, you know, pointed out quietly uh, that you know, my living was being made and a very good living uh, based on my not bringing up issues like this. Wow, that is that is just the antithesis of an academic argument. That sounds like a threat. <laughs> well, it was a threat, and, it, and, and as I decided, you know, so I had a lot of introspection to do, and I wish I could say to you that you know I was so brave, I just did it overnight. It took me months to be able to sort through, you know, knowing that I was going to lose that income because I was already seeing it. When I was bringing the messages from the men's groups into my speeches, 
I could see that I was going in my, my audiences from um, standing ovations that lasted a minute or so to very minimal standing ovations, to no standing ovations, to minimal ovations, to five or six recommendations for different um, speaking engagements per uh, at the beginning, down to zero to one recommendation for new speaking engagements. Wow. I saw exactly what the feminists were telling me that if I decided to speak up for boys and men's issues, that I was basically going to lose um, about 98% of my income. And when, you know, when I figured it out, um, just guesswork figuring out somewhere between 10 and $22 million were sacrificed by, that's by speaking. Incredible. That's an incredible sacrifice. Would you say that's the price that you have to pay to stand against an ideology? Uh, to stand against particularly this ideology, because more than any other ideology, uh, we, um, we have trained and socialized men and biologically, it's part of men's background to be able to be willing to die so women and other people will survive. It's very difficult, if you're, even if you're a parent, you want your, um, and there's a war going on, you're proud of your son for going to war, but at the same time, you'd want your son to survive. And so there's a mixed emotion that parents have and a mixed signals that parents give their sons. You know, we'll be proud of you if you join the Marines or the Air Force or the Navy or the Army um, uh, and fight, for, you know, fight against our country, even in the Ukraine now. You know, every, able, every male from 18 to 60 must stay in the Ukraine and must be willing to fight. Um, and the and so this is just um, and so when you, when you have that mandate the mandate to be disposable to to die so others will live it's hard to attach psychologically to somebody you know you're going to lose and and also to to become a warrior you have to give up being in touch with your feelings you can't say sergeant you just made an anti-Semitic comment. I really, I, you know, my Jewish background makes me really aware of that. Uh, excuse me, young man, uh, do 10 more push-ups. You still <laughs> haven't gotten the lesson, do 20 more push-ups. Soon you learn that if you're, going, if you're going to be part of the war machine to defeat the enemy, to save your people, you, uh, the squeaky wheel um, is not desired. It is, you have to be a, a, a silent cog in the war machine. And being a silent cog means you keep your feelings to yourself. You keep your fears to yourself. You don't express what is really bothering you. That's very good to be, uh, to be, to be willing to prepare yourself to die. It is just the antithesis of what's good for you to be emotionally healthy. So do you think there's a capacity for men to engage, in, especially people who are in the military, to engage with that kind of mentality, which, as you say, is being promulgated onto them by the military and also by surrounding culture, but also to nurture a side that can be caring, that can be loving, and that can be a good husband and father. Yes. Um, men, soldiers, they're basically rough, tough cream puffs. Um, you know, they are writing to their wives, they're wanting to be home, they're hoping that they will live so they can be home. They learn that they, they see things that are very positive that they're learning, like discipline and toughing it out, which are really very important and positive message, postpone gratification. And they're, they're desiring to bring that home to their children, to their families. But when they get home, the mom has already been, she has her, her world set up in her way. And she has, she's been protecting usually the children to a much greater degree than he feels the children should be protected. Uh, when he comes in, he feels, dis it feels disruptive to the mom. And, but, and the, but the father, the soldier's dream of being able to be a useful um, checks and balances to the parenting of the mom, um, oftentimes results instead in arguments that often lead to divorce or at least psychological divorce, and the man feels he's living in a minimum security prison marriage, as is she. And so the, 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 the and so what we don't do in the military is spend, um, if a man has been in the military for uh, six months, uh, to, to take a month or so, 
to make sure the communication between the father and the mother is uh, is good. That um, and by communication being good, I mean that both sexes are able to hear personal criticism without becoming defensive. Uh, the challenge is that that is very challenging to do. I spend a good part of my life doing couples communication workshops in which I teach people how to handle personal criticism without becoming defensive. Um, and it's uh, and it's biologically unnatural to do that. Um, historically speaking, when we heard criticism, it was a potential enemy. And so we had to get up our defenses to, to survive against the enemy killing us, or we had to kill the enemy before the enemy killed us. That was functional for survival. It's just dysfunctional for love. And there's no greater challenge um, in, uh, uh, um, with that than a person coming home from the military, having been just trained to keep everything to himself and his feelings and his fears, and then trying to integrate back to a, a family where the father has not even been part of it um, for a year. And the mother has to prepare the children for the fact that the father may never return. And if he does return, he may be suicidal. He may have PTSD. He may have a temper. He may have uh, responses to things that, are, that, are, that were not like the responses he had before he left. I was very surprised when reading that chapter because I recently read a poem by uh, Alfred Lord Tennyson called The Lotus Eaters. And one of the verses in that poem, uh, you know it, I presume, but one of the verses in that poem concerns the Lotus Eaters giving a, or the, the sailors of Odysseus giving a reason why they don't want to go home because their families are already settled. And if they came back, they would just disturb the order that their wives and children had arranged, and they wouldn't make that better. So better to just separate themselves off entirely and stay on this island in the Aegean somewhere. Um, and that poem being written over 150 years ago, I thought that was really quite striking how this problem had actually been recognized by some people, even as far back as then. Yes. Um, but yes, uh, no. Sorry. How, how very, very sad. And uh, and and a very good observation with the totally wrong conclusion. Um, children need the the children that do the best are ones that have the checks and balances of both moms and dads. Um, moms tend to be very, very protective. If a child wants to climb the tree, she'll say, "No, uh, sweetie. You know, maybe in a few years." A dad will say, okay, just be careful. Um, and it, when the father and mother talk about these things together, they might decide, yes, they can climb the tree, but not beyond a certain point. And dad, you've got to be under the tree to protect the child if, if she or he does fall. Um, and, you know, give me your cell phone so you don't get distracted <laughs> while you're a little child. <laughs> <laughs> it's the <laughs> little compromises, isn't it? Yeah, the little comp and and the, the result of that, and here's the really just the, the, the astounding thing about that, is that dads don't present as part of their perspective that when, when our son or daughter climbs the tree, that their IQ increases, that, the, that making the judgments between what's safe and what's not safe, what's too big a risk, um, forces the synapses to, to, to fire, that, force, that, that increases IQ. They don't learn that when we don't, dads don't say to moms, when I do roughhousing, um, I increase the children's ability to be empathetic. Mm -hmm. And what empathy and roughhousing are counterintuitive combinations. But the data is there that I talk about in the Boy Crisis book about why roughhousing leads to children being more empathetic when roughhousing is done in dad style, dad style being that when, if the children violate the, the mandate to not hurt their brother or sister, uh, that, they that the roughhousing stops. And when the dad actually stops the roughhousing, doesn't just say that, just doesn't keep repeating the same old message that you can't uh, hurt your brother and sister over and over again. When the dad actually stops the roughhousing, when the children are too rough, he begins to teach the children that it's necessary for them to think of their brothers and sisters' feelings in order for them to get what they want, the continuation of the roughhousing. Mm, that's very interesting. Um, that is really interesting. Um, just on the note of mum and dad negotiating over how to bring up the children, you mention a really interesting uh, phrase in this book, which is the glass ceiling at home. Can you expand a bit more on what you mean by that? 
Yes, the, the glass ceiling at home is the opposite of what it is at work, which is that the the, the father often feels like, um, okay, if I'm getting, uh, let's say I'm I'm roughhousing and mom is feeling like, you know, oh, gee, I feel like I only have one more child to monitor. Um, and the dad roughhousing and the, and the dad, you know, um, and she says, you know, I, I don't want to be too controlling. I'm going to feel, you know, a little guilty, uh, um, but I, I don't want anybody to get hurt. And I have just have this fear that somebody will get hurt. Well, mom is about 99% likely to be right. Um, sooner or later, somebody does get hurt. And so, and then mom thinks that, um, you know, oh my God, I should have listened to myself. I feel guilty that I didn't. I should have protected that. That's my role. Um, and so they get into a, a big fight, especially after the dad says, um, okay, you can't treat your sister or brother that way. Um, so the next time, if you do that, there's going to be an end to the roughhousing. And mom says, an end to the roughhousing. Didn't you just get the fact that the kids got hurt? And there was a, you know, an, an end to the rough housing. Now, many dads will just give up on doing the rough housing when they see the negative or give up on doing something else like um, ha having the children take risks or teasing the child mm -hmm. and having the child cry. Um, because most dads are afraid that if they don't, um, that if they continue to do things that upset the mom, uh, that the mom, that there's going to be no sex, that there's going to be emotional distance, um, there's going to be um, criticism, um, and many dads do not have the courage to uh, to do that, and many dads don't educate themselves as to the value of the things that they do uh, that are intuitive, like like the roughhousing, like teasing, like playing, um, you know, you know, like uh, letting the kids climb the tree, take some risks, um, and so th they they don't uh, they haven't read in parents parenting magazines or parenting books, what the value of teasing is. They don't know how to explain it to moms. Moms can't hear what dads don't say. Mm -hmm. So, um, and dads oftentimes, and some dads just don't have the courage and just give up. Also dads, to, to, to be fair to dads, um, the parenting magazines that I did read in the preparation for the boy crisis book, they didn't have anything about the value of teasing, the value of roughhousing. Uh, they didn't explain why roughhousing is connected to empathy, why it's connected to the ability of the child to make a distinction between what's being assertive versus aggressive, why that, why that difference led to postponed gratification, why postponed gratification is one of the biggest predictors of success or failure, why postponed gratification leads to the children doing better in school, therefore being more acknowledged by teachers, therefore being more uh, desired desirable by females, uh, therefore having less likelihood of being rejected, therefore being less likely to do por um, pornography. Um, I mean, that's a lot of beneficial not. effects just from yeah. being a, a good dad, being a present dad and engaging with your child's upbringing. And, and I don't know a single dad who, who hadn't already read The Boy Crisis that is able to share calmly, lovingly, and combine with also listening to the mom's perspective. Um, which is always important in balance. Um, I don't know dads who know how to explain the data behind this, um, but when moms hear uh, that the connection between empathy and roughhousing, the connection between postponed gratification and the children feeling better about themselves, having higher self-esteem, having more friends, more admiration, uh, moms start to listen because moms care. Yeah, I mean, moms also want the best for their children, don't they? Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. No, that's that's very interesting. Um, when I was reading through this book, I felt like you raised a number of quite alarming social problems concerning today's men and boys that we generally kind of know are happening but don't talk about. Uh, for the benefit of our viewers, could you just take us through an overview of some of the problems that you call the boy crisis? Yes, um, I think one of the first things that struck me was seeing that in all 53 of the largest developed nations, um, boys were doing worse than girls in every academic subject, wow. especially reading and writing. And reading and writing are the two biggest academic predictors of success or failure, particularly in school, um, but also in life beyond school. Um, and, the, um, and so that was shocking to me. And then I, then I stuck on the word developed and I realized that in developed nations, that there was freedom for um, for divorce to a much greater degree than there is in non-developed nations, undeveloped nations, or less developed nations. Also, there was freedom for uh, women to have children without being married. 
And I started looking at the samples of children, boys who were doing badly and girls who were doing badly. And I saw that they were very disproportionately among children that had, um, did not have a dad fully involved in the family. Um, and so I started to look more carefully at that and see that the privileges that we got from surviving and being able to survive in developed nations also came with a series of relaxations on the importance of family and the importance of father. Um, and, the, and the children that didn't have fathers um, had a, uh, uh, what I have eventually determined in 14 years of research for the boy crisis to be more than 70 disadvantages, far more that the father absence was the biggest predictor of suicide. It's uh, uh, one of the biggest predictors of depression, especially when you know how to measure depression in such a way that incorporates male style depression. It was, the, it was, uh, it was also uh, a great predictor of boys dropping out of high school. Boys who drop out of high school are more than 20% likely to be unemployed in their 20s. Uh, boys who are interested in, in females um, and um, find out that if they don't, if they drop out of high school, not a lot of women who graduate from college or even graduate from high school are very interested in them. They see the boys as losers. Girls like to date winners. Um, and so they feel rejected by the girls that they're attracted to. Uh, that makes them angry. That makes them hurt. That makes them vulnerable. And that anger doesn't, isn't very appealing. <laughs> and um, mm -hmm. that leads to a vicious cycle of being uh, more and more undesirable. That leads to a vicious cycle of porn addiction, of video game addiction, of having fr friends who are not, um, uh, and the video game addiction and porn addiction doesn't train the boys to be uh, cued into the nuances that girls are much more attracted to um, of social and emotional intelligence. And so you just get um, one thing after the other like this. I was surprised to see that the um, boys do much worse when it comes to um, um, not only mental health issues, but physical health issues. Boys who did not have a lot of father involvement were far more likely to be obese. Uh, they were far more likely to um, have things like bigorexia, you know, addiction to making their muscles look bigger so that they would be, that they thought they'd be more attractive to, to girls. And on and on and on, I started to see that, as I said, there were more than 70 um, different uh, ways in which boys were suffering. I also found out that girls without dads suffered in, in the great majority of these ways, not all these ways, and in some different ways. Mm. Um, girls, for example, without dads um, tended to not have all the nuance of understanding of what pleases a man, what makes a man happy, how to interact with a male. Therefore, they tended to be sexual too soon before, by too soon, I mean before they felt ready to be sexual with a male because they, that was the one thing that they did know is that they could hold on to a male by being sexual with him. And by not being sexual, they're more likely to lose him. So they're sex, sex, without regard for their own feelings because they didn't have a whole series of other understandings of what made a man happy. Uh, they, they would be sexual before they were ready or they would be so fearful of men, they wouldn't even get into a relationship with a man at all. Um, for a longer period of time. So there were differences in the way, the negative ways that dad absence affected boys and girls, but most of them were the same. And the big difference was that the intensity of the problems were more, um, that were much more um, complete uh, with, um, uh, for boys. Mm -hmm. um, so boys were far more like, so for example, boys and girls at the age of nine rarely commit suicide. And when they do commit suicide, they commit it at, at about the same rate. But between the ages of 10 and 14, the boys rate of suicide is twice that of girls. Wow. Between the ages of 15 and 19, the boys rate of suicide is four times that of girls. Between the ages of 20 and 24, five times that of girls. And so, um, and most people don't, ask the question, why, why is that happening? And, mm -hmm. and, and of course, you know, mass shootings, which we just saw two major mass shootings in the United States in the last 10 days, these are not just boys committing homicide. These are also boys committing suicide. Yeah, no, and I think that's a really important point. Um, 
thinking through all of what you've just told me there, it seems to me that the big takeaway from this is that the best thing you can do for your children is to have two present and involved parents in their lives. Would, is that yeah. a fair statement, would you say? That is a fair statement with um, two additions to that. Mm. Um, parents that know how to communicate with each other and by knowing how to communicate, knowing that the Achilles heel of all human beings is our inability to handle personal criticism without becoming defensive. And so that is uh, the reason I started forming couples communication groups around the country is because um, I had not seen couples work solve that problem. Um, people with active listening were learning how to listen to the criticism but they, of, of their partner, but they were keeping their mouth shut. And oftentimes without defenses, uh, they, were, they were having to repeat the criticism twice with, and feeling even more criticized inside of themselves. And so what I found was it was important to find a way that before somebody was criticized, that they altered their natural biological state of being defensive. Mm. And therefore the person receiving criticism learned to associate their ability to hear it with their ability to be more deeply loved by their partner uh, because their partner felt safe with them. And so once they, once they alter their natural biological state of defensiveness and connect being able to hear the criticism of their partner as a, a way of making their partners feel secure and loved and therefore knowing they'll receive more love for that, that plus six or seven other mindsets that I have couples um, delve into before they hear criticism allows them to hear that criticism um, effectively and therefore be able to um, make it safe for their partner to share their real feelings rather than do what most people do in relationships <clears throat> is there. They find themselves walking on eggshells mm -hmm. and oftentimes, especially when children arrive, they feel that they're living in a, a minimum security prison marriage. Gosh, um, that altering of the, of the, not body language, but the altering of the biological state in order to be able to receive criticism in a wholesome and healthy way. Can you just expand a bit more on how you would go about that? Yes. First I have, <coughs> excuse me, um, everybody in, in all the couples groups, um, I teach them how to create a conflict free zone, 166 hours of the week and devote two, only two hours a week to what I call a caring and sharing time. So to sustain that conflict-free zone, um, when they hear a criticism from their partner, they begin to, the, the first thing they do is to say to themselves, okay, I have two options here. That criticism is unfair. I can argue about it right now. And almost invariably, the argument will lead to an escalation of more accusations and we'll both feel worse than we did before. Or I can wait to this caring and sharing time. And before I respond to my partner, I will be able to know that my partner will be in an altered state where she or he will be able to fully listen to me. So they're, gonna, they're not gonna remember that every time, but, as, but the subtitle of this course that I call Role Mate to Soulmate, the subtitle is The Art and Discipline of Love. And so I, I work with couples to develop the discipline of being able to visualize, being able to, able to be heard in caring and sharing time. And that doesn't work for a while, but after, the, after couples have a number of experiences, actual emotional experiences of being so well heard by their partner, <laughs> that begins to take form. And then I say, all right, while you're angry, um, here are six things that you can do with that anger. So one example um, is jur journal. The first stage and journaling has four stages. The first stage of journaling is writing down every reason you are right and your partner is wrong. It's what I call the self-righteous stage. I like that. Get it out. Get it, yeah, yeah, right. we all, <laughs> get it out of your system. <laughs> right. And then e e slowly evolve into, well, there's one thing I could have done differently. Maybe there's a few things I could have done differently. You know, maybe here's it here. Um, here's the way my partner is probably looking at it. Here's her perspective or his perspective. And then down to actually having empathy for your partner's perspective. Often that means that the issue goes away and you don't even have to bring it up in caring and sharing time. Mm -hmm. Sometimes though, that issue remains 
that means it's an issue for caring and sharing time. That's just a little tip of the iceberg. But if, if anyone is interested in more on that, they can um, email me at my or just go to my website, warrenferrell.com. I, I couldn't remember anything more complicated. So they gave me no, some. Um, that's <laughs> actually very helpful. I'll certainly be meditating on that uh, after this interview. That's a, a really good point. Um, so we've talked so far mainly about the environment in the home, but I just wanted to quickly ask, what role do you think schools have in creating or perpetuating the boy crisis and how they might move to alleviate it? I'm afraid schools have gone somewhat the way of feminists. Um, feminists at the beginning were, I am woman, I am strong, and we were empowering women. Now it's very frequently, I am woman, I've been wronged. And in both high schools and colleges, um, I, I, example, I was doing a filming on exactly this issue, um, and we were um, while we were filming, and uh, we were by a creek, um, filming in the in the middle of a, on the stones in the middle of a creek, and some um, young kid walked by and was looking very curious. And I called him over, thinking he was in about high school years. And sure enough, he was in high school. I said, "Well, what do you learn about girls versus boys in in high school?" And at first, he's like he was a little bit shy, and he goes, "Well, you know, I learned that you know the future is female." I learned that you know, men are basically the oppressors and women are the oppressed. I learned that um, that you know that that men are basically um, uh, they have they, this uh, about toxic masculinity, uh, and that I have toxic masculinity, and uh, that I have male privilege. Um, and so I said to him, "If you were to bring this up in uh, uh, with a girl that you're dating." Um, he, he, he interrupted me. He said, I would never bring this up with a girl that I'm dating. He <laughs> <Right>? um, <laughs> said, uh, even if you were getting serious with her, I get, he said, well, maybe then I test the waters a little bit and see if she was open. And if she wasn't open, I wouldn't bring it up. So, you know, here. Uh, and so, and do you feel that this is, that these criticisms are right? Well, there are certain things that are right. I certainly, you know, think that, you know, women, um, you know, if, if you come on too strong and a woman says no, you should pay attention to that no. Um, and so, and, and so I said, well, how do you know which no's mean no, which no's mean maybe, which no's mean yes. And he said, oh, you know, what I learned is that, you know, that what is there about no that you don't understand? Okay, so I said, well, for example, does no mean no forever? Does no mean no till the next date? Does no mean no for just a while and then you try again? Does no mean no until you talk more about her rather than yourself? More about, reveal more about yourself rather than just talk about her? Mm -hmm. Does it mean no until she has had a, a drink or two more so she relaxes? Does it, no, does it mean no until she's had some coffee so she wakes up? Does it mean no until you put on some really nice music? Um, and Gosh, there's a lot of meanings to this now, aren't there? Goodness yes, yes, exactly. And he goes, oh, my God, never thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, um, you know, but I've just taken in the guilt about being an oppressor. And that part of that is when I did pursue with a woman that had sort of said no, I, I worried that I did it too soon. And I also worried that if I didn't do it, I'd be thought of as a wimp. And, you know, and he didn't understand the background, the meaning of that, why it was useful for women to say no, because women found out from no, um, who, uh, who, A, who respected them, B, if the man just gave up after the first no, is this a man they would want to marry? What type of salesperson would he be mm. to make money for the family? A salesperson who takes the first no for an answer, does he succeed? Does he support the family well? So there's thousands of things. I'm just mentioning on the tip of the iceberg that are built into this uh, that that is uh, that are just not understood in this in the school system. And we have you know hard data that I talk about in the Boy Crisis book about when when reading uh, when essays are graded by teachers and teachers um, know that it's a male writing the essay. Uh, they they write they mark that essay. Uh, 30% of the teachers are likely to mark uh, that essay lower than they would if, fe if, that, if a female name was on that interview mm -hmm. versus none in reverse of that. No, that's, that's quite incredible. So one thing that struck me in this book was that you have, I counted, 
over 800 different references at the back to studies and statistics. It's actually a really good piece of work. And I'm very grateful that you did it and I didn't have to because it would take me probably a lifetime as, as it has you in a way. Um, but my one wife, thing, my wife, my wife always teases me of, about having to document everything I say. And she's, <laughs> if you were writing all these things about women, you wouldn't have to document them. People would just believe you. Yeah, uh, no, that's a very good point. But <laughs> it did strike me, and I, I, reflecting on this, I was a little bit sad that doesn't it reflect badly on the state of knowledge in the West that we require hundreds of peer-reviewed papers, research papers, in order to convince ourselves of something so fundamentally self-evident to human experience as dads are good for kids? Yes, um, yes. Some people say to me, I'm never sure whether the boy crisis is revolutionary or obvious. Mm. <laughs> like, you know, uh, But there are certain things about it that aren't obvious. Most people don't know that males have had a 60% reduction in their sperm count um, in the last, uh, since 1980. Most people don't know that male IQs have gone down based on a British study. Mm -hmm. Most people don't know um, a huge, uh, that, that when, that when a, a father gets involved with his children, that a whole nest of neurons develop in his brain that are called that I call the dad brain that is parallel to but different from the ma maternal instinct. Um, but on the other hand, if he just um, focuses on his work um, when the children are born, that dad brain does develop because he's focusing on work as a way of loving the children, but it doesn't develop nearly as in as many, as much sophistication and as many nuances as it does when he is devoted, when he spends a lot of time with the children. Um, most people don't know that children, I didn't know, um, that children at the age of nine and a half, um, uh, when their telomeres are measured, telomeres are, the, are in every cell, and in every cell the telomeres uh, indicate which, uh, whether you have a genetic propensity to cancer or dementia or something else like that. And the longer your telomeres are at the age of nine and a half, that's one of the most accurate predictors of life expectancy. Mm -hmm. So, But what shocked the people who were doing the research was that one of the variables was whether which, which parents were or were not involved with the children. And they found that when dads were not involved with the children, the telomeres were on average 14% shorter, that is predicting about a 14% shorter life expectancy than when their dads uh, than when their dads were involved. However, when the children for the boy children, the the telomeres were yet again forty percent shorter than their sisters when the boy children had no father or, or minimal father involvement or no father involvement at the age of nine and a half. Mm -hmm. All these things were not obvious to me when I started the research on the boy crisis. I didn't know any of them, nor about a thousand other things that um, that because I didn't know them, I had to put the footnotes in for. Mm. And of all of the things that you researched for this book, what would you say affected you the most profoundly? I think um, the sadness of the culture being so anti-male, and, and um, that when I was speaking up on behalf of women, um, that I was on, there was no op-ed I wrote for the New York Times that was rejected. Since I started incorporating boys and men's issues as well as women's empathy for women, um, 28 out of 29 of the op-eds I submitted to the New York Times uh, were um, rejected. Um, I was doing every major TV show um, now all of the mainstream media rarely interviews me. Only Fox News, only the conservative media um, interviews me because I'm talking about the importance of children um, being involved with their fathers. And also with their families. You talk and about with their families, and yes. mothers as yes. well. Yes, um, exactly. If we look at the West, of course, we currently, I believe, have the lowest rate of um, cohabiting parents, if that's the right way to put it, but married parents, to put it mm -hmm. simply. Uh, we have the greatest number of single parents that we've ever had. And obviously, these are overwhelmingly single mothers rather than single fathers and so on. Um, to what extent do you think this development is driven by the feminist activism since the 60s and 70s? 
Well, I'd like to say not very much, but I'm wrong. I, I would be wrong. <laughs> um, fe feminists have been very, very strong. You know, as I encountered when I talked to the my board members of the National Organization for Women in New York City about this, uh, when I said, you know, fathers really are important, it appears. Um, and at that time it was the 1970s and the research was, you know, was about one tenth as sophisticated as it is today. And the immediate response that I got is, you know, we will lose now membership if we do not, um, if we start talking about the importance of fathers after divorce. Then when I started talking with um, Democratic candidates um, for president in Iowa, and I interviewed um, eight or nine of the Democratic candidates, um, and, the, uh, and a few of them were very convinced by the importance of fathers being involved with the families. And in the three cases where they were very convinced, the case of Andrew Yang, the case of John Hickenlooper, um, the, um, the campaign managers pulled me over and said, Warren, uh, we cannot um, risk having our candidates talk about the importance of fathers. I said, why is that? And they said, because our, our single, a lot of our constituents say is single moms, and they're gonna feel like we're saying that um, they're not adequate. Um, and I would say things like, well, what about framing it in such a way that says single moms feel overwhelmed? They need dads to step up. Oh, Warren, too many women will still interpret that as they're not adequate. They want to feel adequate. Well, what about in divorce, the importance of fathers helping out in the raising of the children? Isn't that a helping hand? Isn't that a sharing responsibility? Isn't that equality? Isn't that diversity? Isn't that inclusion? All their key words. Um, oh, we're gonna our, we'll alienate our we'll alienate our feminist base. Um, and I'm saying, didn't you get into politics because you wanted to do what was right? No, not not just to get somebody elected based on um, based on policies that are inadequate. Oh, Warren, you don't understand politics. I have a PhD in political science, but you know I don't understand politics. <laughs> so one thing you said on the subject of single parents, which I thought was really simple and powerful, was that child support should be more about involved time of the father rather than just money. And you yeah. pointed to statistics which show that a an alarming proportion of jailed fathers are jailed because they're being demanded to pay child support that's economically unsustainable for them, and yet they're getting nothing in return, in, really, in, in real terms, in terms of visitation rights and so on. Yes, exactly. And yes, and in some states that's really true, um, like North Carolina, South Carolina. Um, and, and I also saw something that really touched my heart. You were sort of asking me before what most touched me. Mm. Um, I ran for governor of California a few some years ago. Um, and the when I did... I spoke to prison populations. And, um, and as I started seeing the degree to which a lot of the prisoners were, um, did not have dad involvement, I would begin to ask them, uh, raise your hand if your dad uh, was significantly involved with you when you were young and growing up. About 10, 15% of the prisoners would raise their hand. Um, and then I would talk to them about the importance of fathers. I had, in every prison I spoke with, I had fathers come up to me, muscles bigger than I'll ever have, <laughs> <laughs> tattoos, um, you know, sort of um, take me aside, Dr. Farrell, you know, I never realized that I could be important as a dad. You know, what, um, you know, I, I didn't think, I thought that I was basically a loser and I would probably just deserve to be in prison. This is the first time I've had an incentive to live. The first time I've had an incentive to get out of here and help to prevent my children from doing the things I did, making the mistakes mm -hmm. I made. And there were tears often, not always, but often running down their face. These mm -hmm. guys that look like they hadn't cried in a long time. No, I can, I can see that as well. It's, um, gosh, it, it really frustrates me, this kind of problem, because it's one where you know about it, but there is no real outlet to actually discuss it. And if you if you bring up something like men's rights in the context of a casual conversation, say in a, a university parlor or something like that, mm -hmm. the immediate judgment that is made has nothing to do with the issues, but it's on you for even bringing it up. Uh, yeah. It's a bit like in Japanese society, for example, there are various taboos like um, you can't have an intriguing conversation about the use of atomic weapons, for example, because 
of Japan's unique history in that. And people skirt these issues by not talking about them. There is a, an implicit taboo. And it feels to me very strongly that this taboo continues to exist in polite society in the West. Would you say that's been your experience? It is very much my experience. And it's one of the reasons I encourage people first, there's, there's a little bit of a, an escape valve from this experience. When you talk about men's issues, yes, <clears throat> women and all animals, all, uh, and all, all, all you, w- women, all humans and all animals from insects right on up through human beings, fall in love, uh, have sex with alpha men. Um, men who complain, bring up men's rights. It sounds like you're complaining. Men appear to have all the rights. If they don't have all the rights, they make the laws so they can change things to make their rights. Men, co- women fall in love with alpha men, not with whining men. And talking about men's rights feels like the beginning of whining. Right. And that feels to women like fingernails scratching on a chalkboard. Mm -hmm. But what you can talk about to most women and even feminist women who have sons is boys' issues. Mm -hmm. Because even the feminist women with sons, when that son says, I'm afraid to call Krista, um, she, she will want a boy nicer than me. The feminist mother will often say, Gee, sweetie, you're a really capable boy. You're very intelligent. Maybe Chris is waiting for you to call. And suddenly she sees something that she always viewed in a negative way, men taking sexual initiatives and not knowing when to stop in a, in a heartfelt way. Mm-hmm. Her son's pain and vulnerability about being willing, being able to call a girl and things she never saw before when she didn't have a son. Women are biologically programmed to protect their sons. They're biologically programmed to be protected by adult men. Mm -hmm. So the initial instinct is very different. So if you want to communicate issues about men's rights, don't use the word men and don't use the word rights. Mm -hmm. Talk about boys and talk about their hurt and their pain. And when you, when you hear things like mass shootings, help to communicate that boys who hurt us are boys who are hurt. And that's a very profound point. I have so much that I want to ask you. I think I've got through about 5% of the questions <laughs> that I wanted to ask in this, uh, in this interview. Um, Warren, it's been a real pleasure. I just wanted to close off by asking you um, what you're working on now. And finally, How do you think if things do get better in the next 5, 10, 15 years, how, in what way do you think they will get better? And what can viewers watching today do to help things get better in the boy crisis? Yes, good. I've I've begun to see the first beginnings of things changing. I got an email from um, Chris Sprouls, who was the Speaker of the House in Florida, who said he had read the boy crisis because he ha- had three sons uh, that he wanted to raise with no, no implications of doing anything about it. Uh, he read that and then gave it to the, um, the head of the Democratic Party and the Republican Party in the Florida House of Representatives. They read that, long story short, they ended up drawing up legislation about the fatherhood crisis to devote $75 million to helping encourage fathers to become more involved with the family. Mm-hmm. It passed the House of Representatives unanimous by a unanimous vote of both, of both the Democrats and the Republicans, and then was signed into law a few weeks ago by Governor DeSantis of Florida. So that was a piece of progress. Mm-hmm. Kentucky, in the United States, Kentucky was the first of 50 states to pass a law saying that when there's a divorce, um, children should have an, um, an equal opportunity to, to have both, uh, should have an opportunity to have both parents equally involved in equally shared parenting. That's the first law of its kind, but there are five or six other states that are considering laws like that. So that's the beginning of what is, um, and to see, to see that the boy crisis did have an impact on actual legislation and real life uh, was very satisfying to me, to say the least. 
um, I, I, in, in the mass shootings um, area, I got an um, email from a fellow named Carlos, I'm not going to give his last name, um, about six months ago, um, saying that he had, uh, was a part of a fascist group that um, uh, two of its members that had already committed mass shootings. He, he, had, he had drawn up a 52-page manifesto to do his mass shooting um, and um, was about ready to do it. He picked up a copy of The Boy Crisis and what struck him was that the things that I was saying in the boy crisis rang so true for him in his life, including his fatherlessness, that he felt heard and seen and empathized with for the first time in his life. I had many interviews with him afterwards and he said, Warren, it wasn't so much that I didn't know everything you were saying or most of what you were saying, it was that somebody was acknowledging that this is what's happening for boys like me. I was just felt heard what I knew to be true deep inside of me. And just feeling heard was enough for me to give up my desire to do the mass shooting. And thank you for saving my life. And thank you for saving the lives of many other innocent people. But the, you know, if, if there's anything that we need to do as we start needed to start hearing, listening to our sons, realizing that our sons will die so we can live. And while that's good in some ways, training them to die also trains them to disconnect from their feelings and their fears. That creates the toxicities that distance um, us from our sons. So those are the problems that we have to work on in the next um, evolution of masculinity. Well, thank you ever so much for your time, Warren. It's been uh, it's been an honour, but more than that, it's been a pleasure. Um, I look forward to to seeing how this message develops. I hope that many more people have the opportunity to hear it.